He said, I came all the way from heaven. There had been no prophet before him who had ever claimed that he came from heaven. Hallelujah. He said, I was there before the beginning began. And I am the creator. I spoke these things that you see into being. So these seven great I am speak about his divinity and his divine role in the life of his creation. Hallelujah. The first I am that we looked at was that he said, I am the what? The bread of life. We have looked at that exhaustively. Tonight, we are going to continue looking at the second I am, which was that he said, I am the light of this world. I am the light of this world. John chapter number 8, verse 12. Let me read that and then we'll begin to explore that which Jesus came to show us. Then Jesus spoke to them again saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. He was making a, defini a definitive statement that if you have seen him and you believe in him, and you follow him, you cannot walk in darkness because the light that he brings disperses darkness. Hallelujah. The, the Greek word for the, light, the, for the word light there is phos, P-H-O-S. It means to make manifest, to make evident, to expose or to make clear that which emits light and brightness. Hallelujah. That is why I sang the song that Jesus, the, the, morn, the bright morning star. Hallelujah. He is the light of the world. His illumination. Once Jesus touches your life, light comes to dispel darkness. So he said that if you follow me, you cannot walk in darkness. Because you have received a revelation and light that gives you the light of life eternal. Hallelujah. Oh, I said hallelujah continues John 12 46 he says I have come as a light into the world that whosoever believes in me should not abide in darkness I have come as a light of the world you know this world has one sun s-u-n amen and this one s-u-n provides light for the whole world um those in Japan, those in Greenland, those in Australia, those in Africa, all over the world, there's one light source that brings illumination and clears darkness on each day. And that is the light of the sun. As we have one sun, we have one Christ who gives light to the world. He, he disperses darkness. He disperses that which causes us to be blind and not see clearly as we ought to see. That is what he represents. He says, I have come as a light into the world that whosoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. Indeed, what Christ is saying is that for you to even see him and know him and continue to abide in darkness is an anomaly. Are you hearing me? I say, Sir, what? It is something wrong that should not happen. When we see Jesus, certain things must change. Certain things must be removed. Certain things must be revealed. Darkness must go away. Light must come. Oh, hallelujah. On Sunday, I'm going to speak about freedom that comes from the truth. Jesus said that you shall and the truth shall. So that knowing the truth and being in bondage is also an uh, Exactly. You get it. It, sh it shouldn't be that you know the truth and can still abide in bondage. Because the truth, the, the purpose of the truth is to deliver you from bondage. Is to set us free. Amen. Let me come back to that which you are studying tonight. He said, I am the light of the world so that whosoever believes in me, and I told you last Tuesday that the way to see this light is through the heart and is by believing. We don't see the light through our eyes. 
we see the light through our hearts. It is by believing in the work of the light that we get exposed to the light. Until a man has believed directly and singularly in Jesus, he does not have the light of Christ. And that is very important to make everybody understand. Hallelujah. I, I, say, I told you last week that going to church doesn't make you a Christian. You may be in the church environment, in an environment where there is light. But that you need to have that personal encounter with the light through belief so that the light becomes yours. Hallelujah. Without that, you don't have the light. You may have the benefit of the light be healed. You may have the benefit of the light be blessed. You may have the benefit of the light to give in, be given access to certain blessings and many other things. But that does not give you access to the ultimate thing that the light provides. That is life eternal. That can be gotten only when you believe in the light. Then you have access to the life and the light that brings you into God's presence beyond this life. And that is the most important thing that will ever happen to any human being. Hallelujah. Amen. I told you again last Tuesday that I'll be remembered for one thing. What did you remember? The truth. You say, Pastor said it. Oh, Pastor said it. <laughs> Hallelujah. This is the truth. Everybody must be exposed to the light through belief. Then the light has found, can find its way into your heart and illuminate your life so that darkness is dispersed. Amen. In Isaiah 42, the Lord said this to Israel. Isaiah 42, from verse 6 to 7. He said, I, the Lord, have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand. I will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles. So God said, listen, my, my relationship, the relationship that I'm creating with Israel is to use you as a beacon of light to the rest of the world. I'm going to shine through you. And it's the same for every believer. But the, the Bible says that we are the what? We are supposed to be the light of the world. And a light that is lit up cannot be hid under a bushel or a basket. It must be put on the hilltop or on the mountaintop that all may see the light that it exposes to darkness. Amen. As a believer, you must see it as your calling that you have been called to expose and to make evident the light that you have seen and found. If people come into contact with you and they cannot taste Jesus, it is a big problem. Oh, let me say it again. If people come into contact with you and they cannot taste Jesus, it is a problem. They don't taste Jesus because you told you tell them you go to church. No, they taste him because his nature is in you and you manifest his nature. His nature of love. His nature of righteousness. His nature of truth. His nature of his presence. You manifest it. It is clear from you. Amen. Anybody coming to contact with must have a sense of whose you are. And that is how we become a light to the world around us. He told Israel, I'll make you, I'll make you a light to the Gentiles. Watch this for these reasons. One, to open blind eyes. So the light is for opening blind eyes. Blindness refers to walking against the will of God. Blindness refers to walking in the will of the enemy. Blindness refers to walking in darkness of sin. But when we see the light of Christ, the light of the gospel, the light of our Savior, the blindness must be removed. Hallelujah. There is a scripture which says that um, one who forgets that he's, he, was, he has once been saved is as one who is as though he were still blind. Amen? We should not walk in darkness when we have been exposed to the light because our eyes have been illuminated. Our blindness has been uncovered. We must be able to see clearly. And that is one thing you find in any true believer's life. He sees, he or she sees clearly. Amen? Have you noticed that has been my experience anyway. When you come to know the Lord, illumination comes to your heart and to your mind. You begin to understand and see things clearly just because you know him. Oh, hallelujah. 
just because you, you may not have heard it from the word, you may not have read it from scripture, but you will know it instinctively that this is something God doesn't like, he doesn't want. That is understanding, that is illumination. That's what I'm talking about. Because his person in the Holy Spirit comes to abide in us when we are exposed to his light. It brings understanding and revelation. It comes automatically. Amen. The Holy Spirit begins to bear witness with our spirits. He says he will teach, he will lead you into what? All truth and righteousness. That is what the Holy Spirit was sent to do. And that revelation and illumination comes because Christ has found a way into our hearts. Amen. So he said one, to open blind eyes. Two, to bring out prisoners from prison. Now, that is what Christ, the light of Christ does. It breaks the chains of bondage and releases us from prisons. A prison is a, something that keeps you in check. Keeps you from being who you can be. It, it limits your walk. That is a prison. Anything that holds control and sway of, over you must be broken when you meet Jesus. There is no nature there is no attitude. There is no love of anything that must still persist in the life of a Christian when you have been exposed to the light because you can no longer be a prisoner when the light of Jesus has come into your life. Can I hear a good amen? And that is the truth. The, the reason for the light is, for, is, to be, is to release us from the prison of bondage. So when you are still in Christ and you are still in bondage, that is a... Uh, What, what would they call that in mathematics? That equation doesn't, it doesn't work. I don't know whether you are following me. Sorry? Is that an, an improper, I don't know what, what to call it. Whatever it is, it doesn't, it doesn't, the math doesn't add up. Amen? You cannot have Christ and his light and still be a prisoner to your to your basic instincts. The reason why he's there is to liberate you anyway. So how can you have him and still be bound? It ought not to be the case. Amen. It is like having the key to a prison door and then being held captive by the prison. Does it make sense? Oh, I'm asking a question. Does it make sense? If you tell me that in your pocket is a key that opens the door, but you cannot get out of the room. So who should I believe? Do you really have the key in your pocket? You cannot have the key to a jail cell in your pocket and remain chained by the jail. Are you following? So it doesn't make sense. Honestly, it doesn't make any sense for believers to be held in bondage. Think about it. This must cause revolt in our spirits to break just by speaking certain attitudes and bondages of all kinds that we find ourselves in. You are already liberated. Get out and be free. I don't know whether you are following me. Get out and be free. You are not meant to stay there anymore. The, 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 the jail cell door is open. Walk out. Because he came to set us free. It says to open blind eyes and to bring out prisoners from the prison. That is why light came into our lives. It is to bring us from prison. No Christian must be bound by any attitude, any negative attitude, any negative character, anything that is anti-God. No, you, we are liberated just by knowing him. Amen. And he says, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. That is the purpose of the gospel. And he said, that is the reason of Israel. Now, um, I want to address believers. And what this light means to us. And please follow these scriptures very carefully. These are, these are powerful scriptures that will bring you deliverance. Ephesians chapter number 5. From verse 8 to 14. Paul wrote this to the church in Ephesus. To describe their current or present state. As opposed to who they used to be. Follow carefully. Ephesians 5 from 8 to 14. For at one time 
the apostle Paul wrote, you were darkness. For one time, you were darkness. Why would Paul describe them as being no longer darkness but light? Can somebody tell me why? What, what, what happened? What is the change? What happened? Oh, would anybody answer me? I'm asking, why would Paul say that you were once darkness? You were darkness itself. Once you used to be darkness itself, but you are no longer darkness. Why would Paul say so? Follow Christ. So does it mean that anybody who hasn't made that conscious decision is darkness? I'm asking a question. Is it correct? Because Christians of today don't believe that. <laughs> they believe that if you are smart, you are not in darkness. If you have cash, you are not in darkness. Yes. It is not a work in progress. You are either in light, in darkness or you are in light. As you get exposed to the light, the whole purpose of the light is to remove the darkness. How can the sun appear on a place and there can still be darkness? Can you even think about it? It is not possible. Once the sun appears, the darkness is dispersed. So Paul says, guys, you were once darkness. But now you are light in the Lord. And church, I want to emphasize this thing for everybody to understand. Anybody who has not found the light is what? Oh, is what? And we must see them as such. It's the truth I'm telling you. He says, for you were once darkness, but now, but now, you are light in the Lord. Walk then as children of light. Walk as children of light. We have, we have, we have a, a responsibility to manifest as children of light. Is it because you were once darkness and have now become light? Walk as children of light. For the fruit of light is found in all that is good, right, and true. Defined. Walk in that which is good. Walk in that which is right. Walk in that which is true. That is the fruit of light. I have said it many times from this pulpit and tonight is an occasion also to repeat it. Any preacher who tells you don't look at my life but only listen to what I say, run from him as fast as you can for your dear life. Hello? Do you hear me? If he who is pointing you to the light has not tasted the light or is not manifesting or cannot manifest the light, That is a problem. Do you follow? We must, we must, we must have tasted that which we are we are talking to others about. We, we must be able to practically manifest, show that this thing we talk about is true and genuine and real. If we can't demonstrate it, then how can we show others? How can we lead others? Make sense to you? It says, Paul says, for the fruit of light, the result of light, fruit is result. Is found in all that is good, in all that is right, and in all that is true. So a believer does what is good, what is right, and what that is what is true, consequ conse consequentially and naturally. It's a consequence of who we have become. We used to be darkness, and we are now what light in the Lord. So we must walk as children of light. And try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. See? Being the light, meaning that you understand what the Lord likes. That is the meaning of discern. Meaning, decipher. Reveal. Let it be revealed to you. Let it be known to you. Discern. Find out what is pleasing to the Lord. That is how we walk as children of light. We find out what is pleasing to the Lord and that becomes our priority in life. That is how children of light behave. Number 11. Take no part, Paul wrote, in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead or rather expose them. Hmm. Don't take part. 
when you have Christ, you don't lose the ability to walk in darkness. Listen very carefully. But you receive the illumination of knowing what is darkness and what is light so that you can choose light. Let me be what I said because I'm not sure you understood me. Because you have known Christ, you don't lose the capacity to walk in darkness. You can. You can do everything that you used to do before you met Christ and even worse if you choose to. You don't lose that ability. What you gain is capacity for good. And it comes from choice. Because of what you have known. Am I making sense to anybody? So that if, if you don't choose to walk as a child of light, you can walk as a child of darkness even when you have light. We need to understand these things clearly. It says, and try to discern what is pleasing to the Lord. Take no part. So don't be a part of in the unfruitful works of darkness, but instead expose them. Why would Paul write this to the church? To admonish them. Because some were in the light, but were walking in darkness, which they ought not to be walking in. So it was reminding them that, folks, you once were darkness. The reason why light appeared to you was to expose the darkness and take you out of darkness. So now walk as children of light. And just in case you don't understand me, to walk as the light is to walk to do what is good, what is right, and what is true. You must be able to discern, find out, figure out what the Lord likes, is pleasing to him, and follow that. That's what he's writing. And don't be a part of the unfruitful works of darkness, because you can still do that. You can. If before you came into Christ, <laughs> you had to take two glasses of pure alcohol to, to, to land on your plane, you can take four. Your mouth will not reject it. Are you hearing me? But it is your heart that must reject it. So you choose not to do darkness anymore because you know what is right and better. So the fact that you have known Jesus, that you don't lose the ability to be evil. You don't lose it. But you, you have the choice. You receive the capacity and the knowledge to know right from wrong and to choose right. Am I making sense to anybody? It is a choice. That's why the Bible says, take off your old nature and put on. Who does it? You do. It's you make those choices deliberately. Verse 12. He says, for it is even shameful it is shameful to even to talk of, the, of, to speak of the things that they do in secret. Things of darkness are shameful. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Meaning you see things clearly as you ought to understand them. You know what is right. You know now what is wrong. You know what the Lord accepts. You know what the, what the Lord doesn't accept. Then it becomes a matter of choice. A believer is in love with the Lord. To the believer, the Lord is that which is most important to him or her. If you call yourself a believer and the Lord is not that important to you, he doesn't have that first place in your life. The connection and the relationship is not right. It's not, it, is, it might not even be there. Amen. The reason why we do right is because we have found the light and the light is precious in our sight. So we seek to please the light. Amen. If that is not the case, then we have a problem. He says it's even shameful to even speak of things that they do in secret. I will not, Paul says, I will not even reduce myself to talk about them. They are shameful. But when anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. Meaning, when you see the difference, you know what the Lord likes and what he hates, it is clear to you what to do and what not to do. That's what he's saying. It becomes visible, evident. The light exposes and makes things clear to you. There is no argument in your life as to what to do, where not to go, what to touch, 
what not to touch, what to view, what not to read. You know all these things instinctively because of the spirit of God that has come into you because of the light you have been exposed to. Amen. Verse 14. For, any, for anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Quoting from the Old Testament, Awake, O sleeper. Because light has come to you. And he was addressing the church. So church, we are being called upon to awake from sleep. Because the light of eternity has appeared to us. Jesus, the light of this world, has appeared to us. The light is meant for illumination that we can see, discern, know, and choose rightly. The Bible says that the word of God permeates right into our being to where our soul and our spirit confluent is a discerner of our thoughts why because it is on the inside it is deep amen that is the that the place of decision of choice the word of god is able to go that far and help us in making the right choices so that we choose darkness no longer but we choose the light that we have found. May the light that we have found be so bright in our eyes that we cannot entertain darkness anymore. Can I hear a believer say amen to that? May the light that we have found be so precious to you that you cannot, you cannot, you cannot entertain darkness anymore. It must be repugnant to you. It must be repugnant to you. Hallelujah. Peter wrote this. He said, we have been called out of darkness. I am talking about Christ the light and the relationship between the light and the child of God and the rest of the world. And every time we are seeing this over and over again, that we have been picked from darkness and exposed to the light so anyone who has not yet been picked is still where? Is still where? I can't overemphasize this statement. I want to push it down until everybody gets it. You see, because we don't believe this wholeheartedly, that is why we don't even see the need to expose light to people who are in darkness. We don't. We think they don't need it, or we don't see the 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 effect of their continual living in darkness, that they are going straight to where? Uh, like we say, in, they say in America, he has passed on, so he's in heaven, looking down on us. Who told you that? Did he see the light? Did he know the light? People, this, I'm telling you, this, these are the facts of our, our existence. People assume erroneously that as soon as somebody dies, he goes to heaven. Who told you that? And Christians, we are partakers in this folly. <laughs> because we make, no, we make no effort to fix or correct it in other people's, other people's lives. We don't do it. Because we don't think they need, they need Christ. I said it once and I want to repeat it tonight. If you call yourself a believer, a Christian, and you can call an unbeliever your bosom friend, you are just the same as the devil. I'm telling you. You are. A believer cannot have an unbeliever as their bosom friend if you understand what these things are. I'm telling the truth. It must cause panic in your heart to do something about that person's situation. Or you must move away to save your light. But if you can move in tandem and call that person your friend, I don't know how to describe you. It's like somebody is in a piece of, uh, in water, doesn't know how to swim, and the water is 20 feet deep, and you are sitting in a boat, and you are by the person, and you are smiling to the person as the person goes deeper in the water. Can, you call, I call, can I call you a friend? 
you are, you have the devil. You are watching the person drown. And the person is drowning. And you are not throwing a lifeline. You are not throwing a bowie to bring the person out. But you are having good conversation with that person and feeling okay. It means you don't understand what drowning is. You don't, you don't understand what it is. That's what I'm saying. We don't understand what darkness is. That we, we, are, we are called out of darkness. Amen. One day, some of you will understand. First Peter chapter 2, verse 9 to 11. I'm sure this is a scripture that you all know, correct? And we use the scripture to boast about ourselves. We are a chosen generation. We are a royal priesthood. Let, let's analyze it. Peter wrote, but you are a chosen generation. True. You are a royal priesthood. True. You are a holy nation. God's own special people that you may proclaim, make known the praise of him who did what? Who called you out of darkness. That's the important thing. Into his marvelous light. He took you from darkness. Everybody comes from darkness. Until you meet the light of Christ, you are where? I said you are where? You are what? Oh, let's try it again. I say you are where? In darkness. You are what? Darkness. You become a chosen generation. A royal priesthood, a holy nation, just because you have been exposed to the light. And the light has, has shown in your spirit and in your life. And that light delivers you from darkness. Church, may we see these things as our Savior sees them. That darkness is darkness and light is light and the two cannot be mixed. I don't know how well to emphasize this for everybody to understand it the way I feel it. He says, you, you, him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light, who were once not a people, but now the people of God, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Very different, opposite, complete total opposite. So if you can smile at darkness and be comfortable with darkness and you call yourself light, I'm afraid of you. Amen. I said if you can smile at darkness and be comfortable with darkness and you claim the light of Christ is in you, I am afraid of you. You are more dangerous than the devil. I will continue to say this until it, 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 you hear it in your sleep. When you wake up and you're walking, you are hearing it. So that it, it will modulate your life, control your life, so that the choice we make shall be controlled by the truth we know. It's very important, brothers. It's very important. So that you don't skip an opportunity to slide in truth into people's lives. You, you look for those chances and opportunities. You have the least opportunity to tell them that Jesus is the light of this world. You need to find him. Otherwise, you remain in your darkness. The least opportunity you get, you tell people. Because you become a light that must be exposed. You live for him. But people look at your life and they go, what is different about you? And then you have the opportunity to tell them that it is a light that I have seen that has changed my life. Oh, are you hearing me, somebody? We cannot live like the world or the, the children of darkness. We can't. When we claim the light is in us. One, we disgrace and, 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 and shame the light that we have. That's, that's, and that is serious. If we are the light and the world cannot see the light through us, where else are they supposed to see the light? I'm asking a question. If we are the ones God is counting on to expose his light, but the world cannot see his light through us, where else should they see it? Tell me, you tell me. I'll go and have a conversation with God so we can use that means. Where else? Are you feeling me tonight? Are you with me tonight? Okay, verse. Now, 1 Thessalonians 5, 1 to 8, say something. And I want you to see the heading that I put up there. We talk about the day of the Lord, the coming of the Lord. 
The day of the Lord is against those in darkness. That fear, that anger, the wrath that is going to be revealed on that day is not against light. It's only against darkness. So the Apostle Paul wrote to it about the church to explain darkness and light. That listen, this is the Lord coming and the wrath of God being revealed. It is not against the light. It is against darkness. Hallelujah. So if you are on the, on, in light, it is for you, not against you. That is our day of redemption. That is our day of glory, our day of crowning, our day of jubilation and celebration, our day of victory. Hallelujah. Like I've been saying, when you hear that Christ is coming, and that is when you, you have, must begin to confess your sins, you are as dangerous as the devil. It ought not to be the case. Hallelujah. First Thessalonians 5, 1 to 8. Let's go into the word of God and it, some things will become clear to you. Paul said, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, church folk, you have no need that I should write to you. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so, uh, so the day no, that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. It will come unexpectedly. Nobody will know whether darkness or truth or light. Both of us will not know. It, the day of the Lord will appear suddenly. But watch, listen to the good news. For when they say peace and safety, then suddenly destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And they shall not escape. Darkness will never escape the coming of the Lord. Darkness cannot escape. Darkness shall not escape. It will come suddenly. And then it is like uh, birth, birth pains. A woman is there, she's smiling, and then the next moment she's in labor. Everything has changed. It is immediate and sudden. And there's no warning. Such is the day of the Lord. But watch this. But it says, but you, oh brethren, are not in darkness. So that this day should overtake you as a thief. Paul is making a difference. He says, for it is not against you. For you, you are not in darkness, so you are, or you are not supposed to be in darkness. So that day will not bring you pain. It shouldn't bring you panic. It shouldn't bring you concern. It is rather jubilation and celebration. Oh, hallelujah. Church, I'm telling you, if you call yourself a Christian and you cannot honestly, sincerely celebrate the Lord's day and his coming. This is an opportunity. Check your heart and check your life. And fix stuff so that you can be honestly happy. For it's coming. Amen. I remember one day we were flying somewhere along the Swiss Alps. In Europe, the air currents on those mountains are uncompromising. And we went into a spate of serious turbulence. Turbulence to the extent that an order came from the cockpit that all the air hostesses must take their seats and put on their seat belt. So everybody sat down. And then come and see shaking. Then it became worse. Then all the cabin lights went out. And then from the cockpit, they began to read out emergency instructions. I'm, I'm, I'm telling the truth. Put your head in between your shoulders. We, have, we are sorry to say we have come across unexpected turbulence. We are going to do our best, but we must put, begin the safety pro, pro, protocol. Air hostess, oh, everybody take your seat. And they run to their chairs. Put on your seat belts. I'm telling you this for a reason. On that day, in that flight, as I sat in there, I had the most peace.
things you can never have. I'm telling you. you see, it is a day of truth. That's what that they can lie. <laughs> that day you will talk to you. But I sat in my chair and I had the peace of God. Because I knew I had the light of this world. I knew I had the life of the light of salvation. I knew my destiny was with God. That if we never landed that day, I'll be found immediately on the streets of gold. In the presence of Almighty God. And I'm saying that, that that must be the honest state of every Christian. That must be. If that is not the case, do something about it now. Paul is, was telling the church, guys, the day of the Lord is going to come as a thief in the night. But for you, it shouldn't be as a thief. Shouldn't be. Amen. Are you getting it? Shouldn't be. Verse 5. You are all sons of light. And sons of the day. We are not of the night. Nor of darkness. We are not the same. A believer cannot be darkness. A believer cannot be of the night. Therefore. Let us not sleep as others do. But let us watch and be sober. Hey. Watch means be enlightened. Be, 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 be on guard. Watch. You are watching. Life, listen, life is, a, you are, we are making decisions every minute, every hour. Now, how we make those decisions to prove whether we are watching or we are sleeping. Are we sleeping or are we watching? Have we become sober? Sober means we have come down to earth and we are reflective. Just be, be on the watch and be sober. Don't be hyper. Hyper people get high and do careless and useless things. But the believer must be sober. sober, Well-mannered and well-contained. Doing things purposefully and right. Choosing right all the time. Hallelujah. For those who sleep, Paul said they sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. He's making it clear. He's talking about sin. He's talking about the works of darkness. Those who partake in them, they do them in the shadow of darkness. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and as a helmet, watch this, the hope, the looking forward to our salvation. Let that be your security. The hope of salvation. Let that be your security. As being different from the world, Church, we are not the same as the world. And if you call yourself a Christian and a believer, you cannot differentiate between a Christian and a worldly person. May the Lord help you. Church, we must make that difference because that is the only difference in life. You see, when you see a person, you don't see darkness and light. But in the realm of the spirit, there are only two people. There are people who are light and people who are dark. Only two. There are not three people. Hello? In the spirit, there's no rich and poor. In the spirit, there's no handsome and ugly. Hello? In the spirit, there's no educated and illiterate. It's only in the flesh. In the spirit, there are only two differentiations. Light and darkness. Finish. But Christians today have become so worldly attached that we don't see the spiritual significance anymore. We see only the earthly differentiations. We see rich and poor. Beautiful. Handsome and ugly. That's what the things we see. <laughs> we see of the flesh. True. Educated. Nice. Those are the things we see. We don't see darkness and light. But church, as spiritual people, we should only see things of the spirit. Darkness and light. We shouldn't look with the eyes of the world. The world should see those things that way. But we must be different. Is anybody feeling me tonight? Amen. We are talking about light. The purpose of light is illumination so we may see clearly. I am showing you how to see clearly. No unbeliever can call himself or herself my friend. It's not possible. It is not possible. 
I said it's not what? It is not possible. The, the light of the gospel cures the blindness of darkness. And I will end on this scripture. I will go to it through it and then we'll, we'll next Tuesday, if I wanted to end this one, to this, but we will continue a third part of the light. Because there's another element about the believer that Christ said that we, are the, we must become the light of the world because he is the light who has been in us. Amen. And how we can be on a hill and shine our light so that everybody in the house sees the light. You must, you must examine that concept. It is, it is our calling to be the light wherever we are. Shine for Jesus. The light of the gospel cures the blindness of darkness. Now, here I'm going to go a little deep. The, this gospel of the Lord, the purpose of the gospel is to cure blindness. It's to not make people rich. Hello? The purpose of the gospel is to what? Is to cure spiritual blindness and to do away with darkness. That is the purpose of the gospel. If you have been listening to some gospel that is not curing blindness of darkness, you have not listened to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because the gospel of Jesus Christ cures the blindness of darkness. That is the purpose of it. Second Corinthians 4. Verse 3 to 6. Let's examine the word of God. Paul said, but even if our gospel, what we preach, what we tell people about, is veiled, that is hidden, is not made clear, is so revealed, it is veiled to those who are perishing. Hey. So he says, when I stand to minister, what I say makes sense to those who are going where I'm going. That's what Paul is saying. Those it doesn't make sense to, they are going to a different place. So that's the meaning of it is veiled, it is covered. As a preacher, when you are ministering the truth, listen very carefully. To people who are of the world, the message is veiled. They are not interested in it. And he explains why in verse 4. He says, these people whose minds the God of this age has blinded who do not believe, least the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So this gospel is the light of Christ. It is his glory. That is what the gospel is. That is what we must be exposing to the flock every Sunday, every day we are ministering. We must be exposing the glory of the light. That is why I cannot take God's time and God's pulpit to talk about irrelevant earthly matters. When people need spiritual truth, God will judge me. Is anybody hearing me? I know that is not what others do, but I'm telling the truth. A day is coming when these things will be clear. We will not see it today, but we will see it one day. It is going to be abundantly clear. It's like being in school. And then we're having people in the class. Some, they come to the classroom and they pretend they are listening to the teacher. And then when they leave the classroom, they throw their books away. Go and play soccer. Go and do this. Go and play. And play. <laughs> but a day will make it clear. It is a day of examination. And I'm telling you to all that we are doing, a day is going to make it clear. Today, it may not seem clear. Because until examination comes, anybody can do what, whatever they want. Correct? You can, you can do whatever you want. Hey, run from school every night. Go to the club. You can, you can do everything. You can do whatever you want. But a day will come and make it clear. It's the same in the gospel. A day will make all of this clear. So Paul said, listen, if the message that we are preaching seems covered and veiled, it is only to the world, not to the church. The church must listen and they must hear the truth of the gospel. They, they must see the glory of the gospel as we minister. And it says those who don't believe and those who don't appreciate what you are doing is because the God of this world has blinded their minds. 
and they do not believe. And so they don't see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ who is the image of God that he will shine on them. For we do not preach hey, ourselves but we preach the Lord Jesus Christ. We do not preach ourselves but preach Christ Jesus the Lord and ourselves your bond servants for Jesus' sake. I am not supposed to come and stand here and tell you that I am very educated. I have six degrees. I am to come here and minister to the glory of Christ. I am not to come and stand here and tell, tell you I have built two mansions. One of them has seven uh, uh, halls and 14 bedrooms all with two bathrooms each. How can that be the gospel? But today that is what we hear from the pulpit. Because in the, in the pew are people who are more greedy than the devil. So <laughs> they want what they cannot get. And so somebody has to tell them what he has gotten through whatever means only God knows. And people are hoping that they too they will get some. How did this become the gospel? For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness. Who has showed in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That is what the gospel is about. The gospel is about light, illumination, to shine the glory of Christ in people's minds, in people's hearts. When people come to church, they must see Christ. They must see the light. They must experience the truth. That is what the gospel is for, church, brethren. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, that God, who has shown his, in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, this, my, this is our ministry. And if you are seeing light in us, Paul is saying, that light comes from the God who commanded, let there be light. That commander has commanded light into our hearts. And when we speak, his light is exposed. Paul is explaining ministry. Oh, Hallelujah. We'll continue from here next Tuesday. I'm not touching on this. Because here, we begin to describe the believer's walk in light. How we can be the light of the world. Amen. Jesus said, I am the light of this world. When you have been exposed to that light, we must walk in that light. That light must emit from us. It must be evident in our lives. The reason for the light is for darkness to be dispelled. We cannot walk with this light and still be in darkness and still be in bondage and still be part of the shameful works of darkness which cannot even be mentioned. May we be delivered by the light. May, may, may the light of the glory of Christ shine continually in our lives and around us that all the choices we make are discerning the will of of God. Can I hear amen? God bless you hearer. I believe you have been blessed by this word. This message is coming from Triumphant End Time Ministries. We are located in Brockton. Look for us and you'll find the light of the gospel that will send you, set you free eternally and forever. God bless you.